access the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845, and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Hey, Green Lantern fans, you're listening to the podcast of OA, episode number 191. This episode, Phil and I are going to be talking about the new issue of Green Lantern, the new relaunch, and we've also got a lot of listener feedback. I'm Myron Rumsey, and Phil, my friend, we're back and ready for another month. It's April of 2021. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. Everything's going well, man. Uh, Just a couple months left in the regular school year, so, you know, we're just planning for what's going to happen in the summer school, but um, yeah, new Green Lantern. New issue came out, you know, I haven't really read a lot of people's thoughts on it. I mean, it's, I've, I kind of, I don't know, it's been kind of split, but uh, we'll get into it when we talk about it. Absolutely. Uh, so before we kick into talking about Green Lantern, the book, a uh, couple of little bits and pieces of news. Our good friends in the Nodell family, you know, they have an Alan Scott website that we have a link to on our website. And recently they added a fan art section. And I believe last episode, you and I talked about people who might have fan art reaching out to them on Twitter. Uh, so, you know, again, if you have fan art, maybe you've got some commissions that you've had done, reach out via Twitter to Green Lantern GGL on Twitter and uh, they're looking for fan art. And right now they've got some fan art out there and they have also got some stuff from Daryl Banks and Jerry Ordway. Really cool stuff. Yeah. It's a great site. He's doing a lot of good work on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for them to, to, to have that outlet that we know things that they just didn't have before and, and listening to some of the, the audio that's out there of Martin Nodell, you know, one of the interviews that they put out there, that to me was fascinating because I never, I never had a chance to either meet Marty Nodell or even get to listen to him talk. So it's neat to be able to have that. It's almost like, you know, you can't, you can't make it a virtual experience, but it's, it's nice because it gives you a chance to kind of live that moment, even though you may not have had a chance to do that in in your real life. Right. So my friend, we've got a book to talk about. We've got a ton of listener feedback because we didn't do it. uh, it, Didn't do it in the last episode because we were, you and I kind of got chatty talking about the Zack Snyder justice league cut. So uh, we've got a lot of listener feedback this time around and a new book to talk about. And of course, Know Your Core. That's right. Let's get to it, man. I'm ready. This is Salak, Green Lantern of Sector 1418, and you are receiving the podcast of Oa. The podcast of Oa. All right, fellow Owens, and welcome back to another Know Your Core segment. This week, we got a creature by the name of Charkweb. That's right, Charkweb. His first appearance was from Green Lantern Volume 2, number 150 of March of 1982, created by Marv Wolfman and Joe Statton. Space, uh, Space Sector 0501. Charkweb is a member of an unusual species rarely seen among the cosmos. His race has long, cylindrical bodies with multiple frond-like arms at the lower end and a numerous mind pods exposed at the top. Charkweb has been a Green Lantern for many years and is a well-respected veteran of the Green Lantern Corps. When the Corps was reborn, Charkweb, like many veterans, re-enlisted and resumed patrolling Space Sector 501. There you have it, Owens. Another cool member of the Green Lantern Corps coming at you from the podcast of Oa. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light! All right, Phil, we have a relaunch, a new Green Lantern series. And, uh, you know, a lot's been said about Jeff Thorne and his commentary he's made on social media and so on. And, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about his his stories in Future State. But here we get a chance to see a first issue relaunch of his vision of what he wants to do with Green Lantern. Uh, so this was an oversized issue. Uh, neat, uh, you know, artwork by Dexter Soy and, oh, I'm going to mess up the name. 
Oh, what was his name? Marco Santucci. Thank you, Brother Phil, for the save. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, so they did the artwork for this issue. And uh, so, Phil, what were your, your overall thoughts on this? Uh, I enjoyed it. I Well, I had to, t- I had to take myself away from the, the, the prior, you know, two years that we've that we've been reading and stuff, you know, you, you can't really juxtapose it next to that kind of work. Um, so I had to take myself out of it and then I had to go into it knowing that, okay, well, it's not going to be Hal Jordan centered. So let, let's just see what I, let's see what the storyline goes. And, you know, I, I actually thought it was kind of cool. I mean, it was a lot better than future state, but you know, um, the artwork was great. It was comp- it complimented it well. And, you know, I was, I'm, I'm okay with it. I don't, but I don't know. First issue, we were the same way with Grant Morrison. So, you know, moving forward, and you know, that could change my tone. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you never know, right? Right, right. I, I know I uh, when I wrote my review, I took a long time to write my review. Uh, I did publish my review today. It's Friday. Uh, I published it a little bit late because I really wanted to, I wanted to reread it a few times. I wanted to make sure, I was trying to make sure that, I don't take my disdain and my dislike for what the writer has said to try to, to not let it influence my writing and, and how I view the book. And and like any other series, you, you, you can't, like like you said, holding it up to compare it against the Morrison run, that's not fair. You know, it's not fair to compare to compare it to the, to the John's run or any book. You know what I mean? It, it, everything is its own, its own iteration. So you have to kind of do that, and and I have some major issues with the writer. I, quite clear, you know, we've we've talked about it on this the show before. Uh, I I do have some major issues, and uh, to me, to the point at which, and I said this in my review, and I I, I want to say it again here, not because I'm trying to make a point, but I want people to understand why why I'm taking some of the stances I'm taking, and and it's. One, you know, one of the things I, I, I did when I was researching stuff for this review is I started thinking about the fact that this is the first time in my lifetime that I did not buy a Green Lantern number one book. So mm-hmm. I started looking. I was like, well, this is like the 20th time there has been a, a in the 81 years of Green Lantern, about the 20th time that there's been a launch of an ongoing series that's related to the Green Lantern franchise. You know, I'm tying in Green Lantern Corps quarterly and Red Lanterns and Sinestro and that stuff. And I missed out on the first two because I wasn't born yet. But this is the first time I, I chose not to buy it. And it's not because it's John Stewart centric. I, I just have a real hard time with a writer who expresses the feelings he's expressed knowing that it's going to taint his run, whether it comes out in the writing or if it comes out through omission. Sure. Uh, so th- that's why I have a problem. I, I you know, the, had kind of a lively exchange on uh, Reddit th- th- this evening and uh, somebody was trying to minimize this whole controversy. Uh, and my whole point to this and what I was relating to it is that, you know, you wouldn't want somebody who's openly stated they hate Bruce Wayne as Batman to be writing the Batman franchise. And to me, it's the same thing. Uh, I I wouldn't want somebody to write this book if they publicly said they hated any of the Lantern characters. Um, I I just I think I, like I wouldn't is you know as much as you might think I would dream about writing a Green Lantern book, I as much as I'd like to write a story, I wouldn't want to be put in charge of the franchise because I know that I have strong feelings about some of these characters, and I know it would color my ability to tell a story and be unbiased and fair. And I wouldn't lie to you and say, well, that's just my opinion as a fan. I can put that aside. That's baloney. Um, and, and that's how I feel. So uh, to me, it's it's about integrity. I, I, I just, I'm not going to spend money on it. Uh, maybe someday when it's in the dollar bins, maybe I will. But I, I can't. I just, I can't. And, and, and believe me, it hurts me to not do it. Because there's that other part of me that wants anything Green Lantern related to be like I'm all Jones and for because I love Green Lantern, but in the, in the end of the day, my 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 integrity wins out, um, and 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 it hurts. I'll be I'll be honest, it hurts. But anyway, getting past all of that, uh, there's some things I did I did like about this. Um, I think this is probably the first time 
in modern storytelling that anybody has made reference to John Stewart's short stint as a guardian over in the Green Lantern Mosaic book, which was oh, really yeah. the last time that John was given a you know a, a book that really featured just him. Uh, and, and I thought that was neat. I, I thought it was a nice way of, of bringing that in because I think one of the things that that John as a character has is there's a struggle because you've got people who want him to be like the animated series version. And then you've got people like myself who I don't particularly care for that grunt version. I like the thoughtful architect John who's much more um, philosophical and much more, I don't want to say mental because I don't want to say, like I said, John Stewart's mental. It's much more, 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 I don't know what the word is, but you know what I mean. Uh, and and so I like the fact that he brought this in, and and what he did was he used it by labeling John as air quote the bridge, somebody who who forsook the powers of the guardians in order to keep his humanity, but yet he has the benefit of being able to experience life, albeit for a short time, having the perspective that a guardian does. Yeah, that's a fair point because if you think about it, I mean. Hal Jordan's got such a past history with the with the Guardians, you know, and while John Stewart does too, it's not as tenuous as, as Jordan's is. So, if you if you kind of put John Stewart front and center, uh, leader of the core, whatever you want to call him, you know, he's not the kind of individual that's going to interact with the Guardians in the way that Jordan did when when, when you know when he was always around. And I think that dynamic. It's going to be interesting to see how it works because it it even looked like in this issue they were backing down a lot, not sh- doing their oversight like they that they they've been known to do so often. Yeah, I mean Hal's Hal's been downright you know insubordinate towards the Guardians on occasion and calls right. them out, and John kind of does, but he does it differently. Um, and he's also you know I remember not too long ago when John was in charge of the core, uh, I think it was over in the Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps book where John was kind of at odds with the Guardians and he was going to step down. That's much more, you know, John isn't the kind of person who's going to cause that big in-your-face drama that Hal will do, but he'll do it in his own way, which I think is fine. I think it's, I, they can't all be the same. They have to be different. So yeah. I, I think that's going to, and I like the fact that he showed, that Thorn showed the brotherhood between John and Hal, that, Hal knew something was kind of going on with John and has enough relationship because these two guys are, you know, they've experienced more if, than any other two Earth Lanterns. These two have more history with each other and have experienced more things together than any of the other characters. And so it's, it's good to see Hal, for what brief time he's in this book, uh, recognizing something about John and trying to be there for him as a friend. Which was really cool when he, uh, when he, when he was flying and talking to him at the same time was kind of neat. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and and I thought that was a, a nice touch. I mean, I don't think you were going to see. I think seeing Hal and uh, Kyle and Jessica through Hal's report to the Guardians, this was Thorne's way of saying these guys are not going to be part of the story. They're going to be off doing their own thing, but I'm going to let you at least know here's where they are. Right. Uh, and, and so that was fine. And the other thing I really liked was during the whole United Planets thing, when they're doing kind of the roll call of planets and then talk about the planets are voting one way or the other for or against uh, Oa being part of the United Planets, that Thorne made reference to several planets that have history in the DC Universe, but a couple that really had strong ties to Green Lantern history, uh, one of them being Jakul. That was the planet that uh, was kind of being set up to be like New Krypton, you know, back during the Zod arc in Hal Jordan yeah. and the Green Lantern Corps. And yeah. they mentioned Graxos 4, which is the home world of Arishi Arab. Very cool. I didn't pick that up. Go you, man. <laughs> so I, I thought that was neat. I, I think the concept of the United Planets has some potential. I think it's interesting to think about how the Guardians have for all of these eons of history they've kind of been the governing body because the rest of the universe hasn't matured enough to be able to be self-managing. And now you've got a section of the universe that is saying, excuse me, we want to be responsible for ourselves. And now they've got to rethink how they fit into the equation. And I think that there's some good potential there. 
Well, and not only that, but I mean, uh, if you think about it, the Green Lantern Corps in its entirety has been on shaky ground for quite some time now, you know, and I mean, it's even it was even shown in, in earlier issues before Grant Morrison's run when Venditti had it, you know, the tenuous relationship the Green Lantern Corps has with different different worlds. Yeah. And, and so I thought those were some of the strong points. Um, I also thought there were a fair number of weak points. Um, I, I kind of was scratching my head thinking, wow. The United Planets has a problem with Oa, but yet they have no problem letting the Dominator's new core guard the Red Lanterns in. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I thought that was, you know, that was a little dumb. I, I, overall, I found the story a little dull, but I think they, that there was too many things thrown in. And I think the book would have been helped out by some editor boxes here and there. Like, I don't think it was necessarily new reader friendly. You know, for example, what are the Crux Worlds? Mm, I see what you're saying now, yeah. I have no idea. Um, I think somebody said, well, those are the worlds that are in the United Planets. That must have occurred in another title because it's not explained here. And I think that would have been helpful for people to at least get some context. Uh, but, you know, it, it is what it is. What did you think of our boy Simon showing back up? Eh. Um, <laughs> Out of nowhere, by the way. He must have been like just chilling. Well, he was in um, that Future State book. He was on a ship with John and Kelly Quitella on their way to Oa. Yeah, um, right. So there, there was that. Um, I kind I kind of dug the dress outfits. That was kind of neat. Uh, I, I think the I think one of the major problems I had with this issue was the whole Teen Lantern thing. Uh, I, you know, I, I think it's one of the, I think it's a dumb idea, but I know some people like it. You know, I, I think it's stupid. That's just my opinion. Um, it's funny because the whole entire time I was reading it, I felt like there was a, just a teenager throwing a temper tantrum the whole time in the background. The story's going on. Yeah. I, my, part of my problem is, is I, I just, I can't see John Stewart or the guardians thinking it's okay to let some preteen with an attitude walk around with a weapon of mass destruction strapped to their back. And... I, you know, they, they locked away Krona's gauntlet. Why is this okay to let her walk around? And why are they walking on eggshells around her instead of just taking the darn thing? Right. Fair point. So I, I have a problem with that. Uh, and I think Simon, the problem with, I have with Simon is, yeah, he's, he's, he, he's not, he's not been a well-loved character. There are people that like him. That's, that's fine. But I think. John John's character is very flat and you need somebody like a Kyle or a guy or a Hal for him to play off of that's a little more charismatic to bounce off of. Okay. I mean, and I, that's, that's a good way to put it, right? I think Simon is more of a yes sir, no sir kind of thing. And so there's no there's no um there's no tension between the characters, there's no nothing there's nothing colorful or interesting or entertaining. I guess it's, entertaining is probably the, the word I'm thinking of. You know, I, as much as I like some of the other stuff, I, I just I, I kind of felt a little okay. You know, um, I think the brigade is an interesting idea. That uh, you know, there's this group that that's kind of competing with the Green Lantern Corps for the right to be the police force of of the United Planets. Uh, I. Kind of would have liked to have seen Legion show up. Uh, I'm not sure if you're... Are you familiar with Legion at all? Yeah, I'm familiar, but, I mean, it's been quite some time. And I don't mean Legion is in um, the Legion of Superheroes. I mean Legion is in... Uh, it, was, it was a Keith Giffen, a Keith Giffen book uh, in characters. And they were basically a team of extraterrestrial superheroes. And they were kind of an interplanetary police force who act as a peacekeeping force, but they're kind of almost for hire in a way. Uh, and, and they, they were, they also, there was a, there was a book called rebels that came out of it too. And that was, that was an abbreviation that stood for the revolutionary elite brigade to eradicate Legion supremacy. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's kind of neat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I'm not saying off the top of my head. I, I looked it up. I'm, I read enough notes. I don't want somebody to think, Oh my gosh, he knows this. No, I don't. Uh, but interesting characters, and I thought because there was at one time uh, a lot of history and a lot of 
back and forth interplay between the Green Lantern Corps and Legion because they were competing. You know, the Legion stepped in and said, hey, we're going to be the police force. And they were competing with the Green Lantern Corps for for not officially, but they were kind of, you know, one upping each other kind of thing. It was an interesting dynamic. And I would have loved to have seen that. Um, but at the same time, the brigade is interesting. I, I thought the Thanagarian leader was a little too on the nose with Shayra Hall for me, but I also like the fact that she, like, <laughs> there's the line that she says where, you know, enjoy your sunset. And I was like, that's literal and figurative the way she's saying it, you know? And I thought, I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, it was cool. I like, I like the Thanagarians. They don't, they don't do those enough in books. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think with, with, John, people, some John fans who are who really love the animated series, they want to see the Shara Hall John Stewart relationship, and I think it's almost a a disservice to them to t- kind of tease that because there's there's a little bit of tension there. But he's already gone on. Thorne has already gone on record saying that that John does not have time for a romantic relationship in this book. So I I don't know. I I would like to have seen Legion, but that's just me. That's my opinion. That's all. You know. Um, I think that, that Thorne has a good grasp on John's voice. I just don't think that he writes him very compellingly. But it's the first issue. Who knows what's going to happen? That's right. That's right. And that's fair. I mean, because like I said, we said we said the same thing about the first issue of, of Grant Morrison. Well, not the same thing, but you know, we had our we we were we, we had our hesitation. We didn't know what to expect. And, right. We didn't know which version of Grant Morrison we were going to get. Right. And we got both of them, I think. <laughs> or right. or all of them. There's probably more than two. Uh, I, I, I thought it was interesting when we had the magical people show up and kind of all, all heck breaks loose. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to pronounce it, but I'm going to, I know I'm going to mispronounce it at Matt <laughs> Uh is an interesting thought of, of a weapon. I, 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 I don't know. It was interesting. I, I kind of just thought it was, the ending was a little rushed. I think, you know, this guy shows up and tells him, kind of gives him a, a, a video game clue of how to solve the puzzle. And I, I kind of wanted to see John do something with his ring. Like, not once in this book did John really talk to his ring at all. And I'm thinking, you know, John is the, to me anyway, he's the tactician. He's, you know, to, to me, he might, in this situation, have people get people to safety. But he'd be asking his ring to analyze this threat. And he never did. It was just he kind of went at it like a hammer. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's true. He didn't speak to his ring. I was just flipping through it again. And and so I kind of missed that dynamic. To me, to me, it's 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 like I think he's gone back to Thorne has gone back to the ring as a weapon. And I I think yeah, the ring can be a weapon, but in more ways than one. Uh, what I I enjoyed about the Morrison run was how he kind of took that whole you're carrying the the greatest weapon in the universe on your finger to being something more than just a weapon. Right. Uh, and again, I don't want to compare it too much, but we've seen that in the past where the ring has a lot of functionality. It does a lot of things. If this creature or weapon comes from something the Guardians did, there may be a record of it somewhere. I mean, the guy that shows up read about it in, a, in the book of OS, so it's not a top secret thing. Could the ring have identified what that threat was? Oh, that's true. That's a fair point. I've always felt like the ring was an extension of the character, the person who's wearing it. You know, it. I mean, it's like it's an indomitable will. You know, it's 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 part of who they are. You know, and we've seen it time and time again with different lanterns and their constructs and and, and how they handle situations. What did you think about the death of the guardian? At the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh well, yeah, he is dead for sure. Which one was that? Well, how many times did the Guardians die? <laughs> <laughs> I, the, 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 uh, yeah, that was my... I, I would have... I think I would have... I was done for shock value. At, at least I feel that way. But I have no idea who it was. And yeah, I I don't want to sound like I'm cold and heartless. I don't, like, I don't care who it is and it didn't have any impact. But not knowing who it was, and it didn't look like any of the Guardians that we've seen before, it's hard to be too overly jaw-dropping, oh my God, they killed a guardian when it was just like a throwaway guardian. You know what I mean? Well, so, well, the, the girl, the person at the end said, my brother is dead. Yeah. So I'm assuming we're going to find out in the next issue who that was. But I know they called each other brothers and sisters l- figuratively. 
But uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I yeah, I don't know. I I'm, I'm hoping we're gonna see uh, who who it was because I think that adds weight, and I felt like it was lacking here. You know, I I would have if I had known who this guardian was earlier on, and then after seeing the speech that he gives about how the guardians need to reevaluate who they are and step back from being everybody's parents to being their older brothers and sisters. I, if I had had some connective tissue to who that is, I think when he was killed at the end, it would have had more weight to me as a reader. Uh, I also thought he died awful easy because we've seen guardians die, but usually not like a one shot. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then getting torched in the process. Right, right. I, I did, you know, I got to talk about the art, though. The the Dexter Soy artwork, you know, you and I commented when Dexter Soy did, uh, he did the Green Lantern story in Future State, how beautiful his artwork was. Mm-hmm. And uh, this book, I felt the same way. There were there were some artistic choices I I didn't like. I, I wasn't thrilled with the, the Sinestro Corps outfits. Seeing Lissa Drack in pants was a little unnerving to me. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure I like what they did with Dexter. No, there there was actually a few people made a comment about the way he looks. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure what the what the point of that was. But did you notice who was apparently alive again? Uh, let's see, which page are you on? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't have a page in front of me, but uh, Muck Muck. Muck Muck, where's he at? Um, there is a scene. Gosh, I got to pull it up now. Uh, there's a scene where they show a bunch of Green Lanterns in the background. Is that where they're flying on that? Where they're hovering? Let me. The one on the left looks like Carrie Wren. Ooh, it, it could be. There were some of them you couldn't always tell. Like you can see in the crowd scene that you can see Zillia Zox, who you know he had, he had such a wonderful death. Uh, he's back again, apparently. Uh, you know you don't know whether somebody was just I need some characters. I'm going to draw what's familiar, but not knowing that they're dead. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that shot where they're doing the oath. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can see Muck Mutt's head between John's knees. Oh yeah, I love Muck Muck, and and, and Rotlap Fan is there in the background. Uh, it, it looks like Hanu is there. Uh, I didn't, you know, Chazelon is apparently back again from the dead. So you know, it, that's it, it. Was also interesting to see Zudarian, who's not Somerlay and is not Tomer Two. I think we're not sure what the name is. It's not Trilla True. Who's the guy directly to the right of Stuart? Uh, the guy looks like Avin Sir. I am not sure. I thought it was odd that he has the old style. Uniform like Abin Sir would have. Yeah, not, I haven't. He looks purple too. Yeah, yeah, it's odd. Know, yeah, he looks purple. He's got white gloves on. I also thought it was a little odd that when their uniforms go away, a lot of them are wearing Earth clothes. But <laughs> 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 if maybe some alien garb would have might have been more appropriate for some of these characters. But you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> hey, if you go on that where the, all those lanterns are at, yeah. Okay. You see the guy on the bottom right with the black pants? Yes. Okay. That looks like an ion emblem in that character on, right beneath his crotch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know who some of these characters are. I I personally, as soon as I saw Muck Muck's head, I was like, oh, Muck Muck's back. I love Muck Muck. Uh, <laughs> but I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's back or Dexter Sawyer or Santucci. I'm not sure which one drew that page. Uh basically it looks like santucci i think uh was like i need some stock images of green lanterns and so they went out and googled them and drew those characters in not knowing that they may be dead uh who knows uh it's always interesting i mean it's it's printed in the page so it's canon now so they gotta be back either that or muck muck's got a brother who inherited the ring Uh, (laughs) one of his race man (laughs) yeah you never know uh but that that was kind of neat. the uh, the mysterious character that showed up. Now we didn't get a name for him, but I thought his outfit was very Green Lantern esque. Uh, a little bit different color scheme. You know, he's got like the the white circle on the poncho, the lines that come down like you'd see on an orange lantern a little bit. So I kind of wonder is this going to be a new lantern type that we haven't seen before? You talking uh, about the guy who shot the arrow? No, the guy that shows up and gives John the clue. That apparently has read the Book of Oa. Oh yeah, okay. I see what you're talking about. Now he's kind of got gauntlets on his arm. He's got boots that are just like a Green Lantern boots, just obviously different color scheme. Yeah, that guy. Huh. And we didn't get a name, but I, I 
you know, interesting character, I think. I don't know yet. Uh, but he, he, to me, it was like a video game. He gives him, gives him a clue, a riddle that, that John has to solve. And it just kind of comes really easy. But... I, got, he, I haven't seen him before. No, no, I've never seen him before, so I'm not sure who that is. And, you know, we see, you know, getting back to that scene, there's another Green Lantern there who I don't recognize, that insectoid character that's standing next to Kilowog. Um, I, I don't recognize that character at all. Nor the uh, little... When they're in the, the hall? Yeah, in the hall. And I don't recognize the little guy with the big eye. Oh, yeah, I don't recognize him either. But it was also neat to see the Sinestro Corps, some of the characters there, Tri-Eye and MASH. Uh, interesting that Sorenic Natu is nowhere to be found. Uh, also, Atrocitus. I never thought they would have used him in this. Well, yeah, that was one of the things I felt was a little odd because you can see Atrocitus in the background in that crowd shot uh, when they when they kind of go to the, the part where they're in the, the center and the Green Lanterns are there and you can kind of see... Uh, the Red Lanterns in the back in a podium with the same shot where you see Zillia Sox. Oh, okay. Yeah, there he is standing up there. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of think he's there, but I can't imagine if it was him, he wouldn't have been involved in the fray. But I think clearly, it, to me, it implies it's, it's Atrocitus. I would have expected him to show up during the fight. I also would have expected him to maybe have some interactions with uh, Sinestro because there's no love lost between them. <laughs> It's true. I like how we talk about it. Like we like we're, we hang out with these people all the time. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love seeing Crib. Crib is one of my favorite Sinestro Corps members too. So that I thought that was kind of neat. I I just wasn't a fan of their outfits. Um, I think it looked okay in some of them, but on Lissa Drac in particular, and on Arkillo, I thought it looked really weird. But this reminded me of that scene in uh in um. The Star Wars movie. You know? Yes, you get kind of a Phantom Menace vibe out of some of this. Mm-hmm. But I had a hard time seeing seeing Arkillo and Alyssa Drac in that in the outfit. I mean, because Alyssa Drac looks, you know, she's got the handcuffs on. It looks a little dominatrixy for a little BDSM for a galactic meeting. <laughs> well, not only that, she doesn't I mean. I mean, I don't know. I've always she's always struck me as a villainous type of character. That I mean. Looks looks beautiful, but looks more uh, sinister. Uh, to me, she just looks like a Disney princess. <laughs> I know what she got, gold, she got gold earrings on. Yeah, I and I wonder what happened with Sornik Natu. I there's a part of me that thinks you know there's this this um, story pitch contest going on the round robin thing. And there's a Green Lantern story that's being pitched with Kilowog and Kyle. And it talks about how Kyle is not, you know, they're not sure if Kyle, Kyle's not sure if he's going to be able to deal with this situation that he gets involved with. And of course, part of me wants to say, well, it's Sornik Natu is the big bad. And so that brings all that up. But who knows? Which, by the way, that last I looked at that vote, it was the Zatanna one was winning. Was it? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I, I thought the, uh, the I, I thought Sinestro looked really cool in the outfit. I just didn't dig it on some of the other people. Yeah, but. it's a neat looking. It, well, you know, I mean, it's not your Sinestro core outfit. Obviously, this is regalia for this for this uh, right nations meeting. So, I mean, it's fun to see it in a different kind of context. Yeah, I just, was, I just I just wish they hadn't chose to put Lissa Drac and Arkillo in the group. <laughs> Well, I wish Arkillo was allowed to wear that tongue that's around his neck. It's not on there. No, I would have liked to have seen Sornik Natu in the in the group, but yeah, but it would have been cool seeing her stand next yeah. to her father. And we don't know what's happened because the last I knew, that, the last I can re- recall, Sornik Natu was in charge of the of the Sinestro Corps. But we haven't seen them in a long time as a group. And here, obviously, they're they're new Korrigar still, so they're they're still using War World and and doing what they're doing was it war world or ranks i can't remember which but they're they're still doing their th- their own thing rebuilding Korgar after it exploded and and so on so it'll be interesting to see what happens you know i don't know whether that's going to be a main part of this ongoing series because we know two issues from now by the solicits the power battery is going bye-bye so hmm. 
And I guess well, I guess that's one of the one of the, the things I I'm not looking forward to in this series is that future state arc was not good and I don't really want to see Green Lanterns once again not being able to use their power rings. We kind of already been there, done that ad nauseum. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, it was a it was a it was an okay issue. I mean, it, it's a it's a questionable opening because you don't know what direction this writer's going with. So, um, but I mean, overall, to me, I mean, it, I think it set up something that could be kind of cool. But again. Our own phrase, time will tell. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's some potential. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just don't think it was a very strong first issue. I do hope he stays with uh, throwing a lot of the different core members in there. Yeah, I, I don't know where he's... Obviously, we don't know where he's going to go with this. I think I think he's really going to go with the Kund and, and the story we saw with Future State, at least for a little while, you know, because I, I, we already know that's kind of the direction it's going to go in. Uh, but we'll we'll see where he wants to go in the long term. You know, I think he wants to go down some paths that we haven't been down just to be different and to be unique. And, you know, one of the things that I think is difficult for any of the other Earth Lanterns except for maybe Kyle is that they've always been in the shadow of the core mythology and Hal's villains, and they don't really have rogues of their own. And, yeah, you can have John and Guy fight Sinestro, but... it's not the same as Hal fighting Sinestro. Mm-hmm. I look at it as is John and Guy is, 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 you would look at Sinestro as an enemy, but Hal, for Hal, it's his arch enemy. Big difference. Yeah, it's a big difference, especially in how you approach the situation. Yeah. So I, I think, I think at least, and this is just me projecting or me speculating, I think that Thorne wants to try to develop some other, other thoughts and other characters so that it expands the universe and gives some of the, John in particular gives them, gives him some relationships of his own that he doesn't really have other than with fatality. And, and, and that's good. That could, that could only embolden the, the green liner mythos even further. Yeah. You know, it, it's time to grow some of this stuff. And, and, and I agree with that hundred percent. It's time to, to see more of the DC cosmic universe. You know, we we had we've had some periods in the past where there's been a lot of other cosmic stuff, and this kind of all folded down into the Green Lantern books, and and it's really been underutilized. So, I want to see more of that kind of stuff. So, so out of out of, this, out of this book, you say probably say the your weakest link was Teen Lantern. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay. um, and I know that Thorne didn't choose to write Teen Lantern into the book. He was told to put Teen Lantern into the book. So, I, but I think he's finding ways to try to utilize her. I just, eh. <laughs> I, I would much rather see time given to some other character. Uh, that's, I that's, just don't, I, she, she's better served in a different book. Hell, I mean, she'd be good in like Teen Titans or something. You know? I think she'd be better without a power pack on her back, but... <laughs> Well, that's fair. <laughs> but anyway, I... I was giving her some kind of benefit, but okay. <laughs> I, I I didn't think this was as... I think it was better than Future State. Yeah, it um, wasn't as bad as you, as you thought it was going to be. Um, well, I, you know, th- apparently there were people thinking that they were he was going to kill Hal. And I'm like, there's no way he would kill Hal because he's already got his feet held to the fire for what he's been saying. If he turned around and killed Hal, can you imagine? Uh, right. <laughs> that's not going to happen. You know, we've seen Hal here and we probably won't see him again in this book. Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, whatever it is. So, so I, I think this was just his way of getting those characters off the off the page. So nobody's say, saying, "Hey, what happened to these people?" We now know they have a mission, and they're off doing whatever, protecting the Crux worlds. And and we know that when the power battery goes out, stuff is going to happen. We've kind of already seen what's going to happen. So, um, so yeah, I I don't think it was it was necessarily an awful book. I thought it was just kind of average. Okay. On yeah. a scale of one to ten, I gave it a six. That's fair. That's a fair. That's a fair rating. Uh, oh, and the, the other art thing I did want to point out: the design of Teen Lantern, like her head, was. <laughs> 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 it, it, and 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 the eye structure. I was like, 
did she turn into like a chibi character all of a sudden or what? <laughs> uh, and I know those are design choices. You know, I'm not trying to be critical of the, the technical part of the art. I think they're design choices that I just, that don't resonate for me. Hey, but that, that's, that's the way it is. It was much like me being bummed out when Simon showed up. <laughs> and here issue comes Simon. Issue four is going to be a Batman team up. No. <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah, I wonder how long. I wonder how long it's going to take for this title for Batman to show up in it. Right, right. Well, my power ring is blinking, which tells me we have some listener feedback. All right, so, let's get to them. Absolutely. So let's pause for a quick second. I know I need to wet my whistle, and we'll come back and we'll hear what people have to say. <laughs> Right, ring slingers, my ring and Phil's ring is lit up. We've got some incoming messages, so Power Ring, why don't you go ahead and play the first message? Our first message is from John O. Is good and comes via YouTube. His comment is about Green Lantern season two, number twelve. Transmitting in three, two, one. Hal is just going back to work. He didn't want another big party about how great he is, like back in season two, issue one. Grant's Hal is like the littlest hobo who just wants to move on to help the next person along the road and doesn't need or want a lot of recognition. I love the analogy of Hal is the littlest hobo. Uh, John, good, uh, John is good. I think uh, I think you're right. I, Hal didn't want to party. He wanted to, he wanted to get out there and just go exploring again. He was kind of tired of everything and what the Guardians were going to do, and so he kind of hit the trail. You know, and if you think about it like this, man, Hal's already always went his own way. You know, he's never... He's never beholden to any kind of strict kind of guidelines or whatnot. He's always, he's always, he's, he, he always shoots off and does his own thing. I mean, I mean, I take some solace in knowing that if Hauser doesn't appear in this book, he's off doing his own thing. He's going to appear sooner or later. So, <laughs> but that's really a good point about the hobo. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes think Hal doesn't, you know, march to the beat of a different drummer. He's beats a different drum. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Myron, my ring uh, is going crazy here. I'm ready for the next message. The next message is from Shadow of Batman and also comes from YouTube. His comment is also about Green Lantern Season 2, number 12. Transmitting in 3, 2, 1. Good discussion. Sad to see this series end. There were tons of world building and great sci-fi concepts that this team brought to the table. I feel Grant still has more stories to tell, but alas, he has to leave. Personally, the newer stuff doesn't excite me. I believe Grant proved Hal has a lot to offer to current DC, but I guess Hal's challenge has always been the times. I do wonder if the reception of the new 52 Green Lantern had an impact on how GL is right now. Because when Robert Venn did he was trying to find his footing with GL some of the decisions made were I think a turnoff for some. And Kyle and Carol being a thing. Oh a being destroyed. And while books like Sinestro and Red Lanterns were great, I think those flew under the radar a little bit. All right, all good points, Shadow of Batman. Um, I'll say this. Uh, I agree with you about um, Grant proving how uh, has a lot to offer. I mean, he always has in the past, and he still continues to deliver uh, no matter what book he's in. Um, and, you know, the one thing I'm going to miss about the Grant-Liam uh, run is it that whole two years reading that, it felt like Green Lantern, it felt like Hal Jordan was in it. it it was its it was its own. Um, it, it wasn't connected to anything. It wasn't connected to Justice League. wasn't connected to Wonder Woman. I liked how it was it was left alone, and it's and it stayed in its own bubble for that long. Um, and and they built a great uh, mythology with the with the character during that time. Um, as far as the New Fifty Two stuff, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I liked New 52 when it came out. I mean, there, there were some things that I didn't like, like the, a couple of the stuff that you mentioned, too, like uh, the Kyle and Carol thing. I kind of could have done without. Um, uh, but, I mean, to me, I didn't have a big problem with the New 52 like a lot of people do. I know that Myron and I, you've talked about it a lot, about Venditti being um, beholden to a certain, I guess, a certain criteria when he first took over Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern stuff. Um, but what do you think? Well, I, 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 by and large like new 52. I think the problem with green lantern as a, as a franchise or as an intellectual property is that DC had it built up to the point at which it had five books that could sustain themselves. And it had a lot of momentum. And when Jeff Johns left, 
no, no, I'm not besmirching Robert Venditti. I think he's a wonderful writer. I think he's a great guy. You know, he's been on the show a ton of times, five times. I think he's been on the show. And I, I think the world of the guy is a human being. But I think he was put in a bad position to try to follow a run like that. And I don't think DC had a great plan. You know, I, I think, you know, when Jeff left, they took Peter Tomasi off of Green Lantern Corps. So you had no sense of stability. And you brought in uh, Van Jensen, who up until that point had not written anything comic book related other than uh, Pinocchio Vampire Hunter, I think it was. So you, you bring in two people who don't have a hugely terrific pedigree to take over what was arguably DC's biggest franchise at the time. And they didn't have a lot of support. And so it slowly started to fall apart. And in things like the Kyle and Carol thing, I think that was an awful, awful choice. And I think, it, you know, Robert Venditti didn't want to use Carol. Why somebody decided to pair her with Kyle and keep that going. I don't know. I thought it was an awful choice. Uh, but I, uh, I think that the New 52 did have an impact on how GL is right now, if only for the fact that I think DC took their eye off the ball. Uh, hmm. But anyway, so uh, Power Ring, why don't you go ahead and give us the next one? Our next comment comes from Corey. He has some thoughts about the new Green Lantern writer, Jeffrey Thorne. Transmitting in three, two. One. I tried to pump myself up for the Jeffrey Thorne run much like you would try to convince a kid that going to the dentist isn't that bad. I like Jon Stewart, and I thought Thorne's enthusiasm for the character might bring a cool take, unlike anything we've seen before. After Thorne's wet noodle introduction to Green Lantern fans with Future State, I think I'm just going to save some money and wait for the new series to show up on DC Universe Infinite. In the meantime, old will be new for me as I'm reading the entire Silver and Bronze Age issues of GL, not just key issues. At the same time I read Future State, I also read Green Lantern, Volume 2, Number 133-135. to Written by Marv Wolfman, a ringless Hal Jordan takes on Dr. Polaris, highlighting Hal's metal and superior willpower. There are parallels to a ringless Jon Stewart in Future State, but the difference in writing is staggering. Keep up the good work and keep your power rings charged. Corey, I'm right there with you, brother. Um, I, we, we've kind of, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but you know... <laughs> we uh i i don't know i i don't want to say anymore because i don't want to i don't i don't want to sound like one of those grumpy old comic book guys i i just don't i'm trying to be optimistic but it's it's a struggle uh, i thought it was neat though that you talked about reading though green lantern volume 2 issues 133 through 135 those issues were hugely influential to me uh in fact if you if you haven't listened to episode 126 of the podcast of OA, Phil and I actually did review those issues back in that, that episode. And I also wrote an article called Flashback Friday, and I'll link to both of those in the show notes. But I wrote a whole article about that because that story was huge to me. Um, particularly issue 134, when Hal is stranded in the Arctic without his power ring, and he's got to fight off, I think he fought a polar bear and a wolf and everything else to get back to civilization. He'd gone snow blind. And I actually was fortunate enough a couple of years ago to meet both Joe Statton, who did the artwork, and Marv Wolfman, who wrote those issues at a convention. And they signed issue 134 for me. And I told them both the story about how, uh, and I've shared this on the story before. I have a birth defect and, and, and I struggle with some eating and swallowing issues. But as a kid, uh, back when this issue came out, uh, I had a particularly difficult time where I was choking and I was all by myself. And, you know, this is before 911 and all those things. And I was home alone and I was starting to pass out. And one of the things that I, 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 I drew inspiration from was this story because I was like, you know, Hal talks about how uh, the, the measure of a man is one who can accept all of his weaknesses and make them his strengths. And, and, and it helped me find inside of myself the strength that I needed to get out of a situation where I was literally choking to death and I had no one to help me. Uh, and and uh, so this issue has always had a, a, a really soft spot in my heart. So to, to hear that you're reading it and you loved it and that, you know, talking about how the difference in writing is staggering between this and the, and the Green Lanterns losing their rings in Future State, I, I agree with you 100%, buddy. I like how he's going old school, you know. I mean, go him for just going going back and saying, you know what? I'm just gonna bring, I'm just gonna make the old new for me. You know what I mean? And 
I haven't done a lot of, I mean, we do the retro reviews and stuff like that, but I haven't done a, like a good bulk reading uh, back issue story of Green Lantern in a while, like a full volume. And uh, I've always wanted to. There's some Kyle Rayner ones that I've missed out on that I do want to read um, that I haven't got a chance to yet. But uh, go you, Corey, and uh, enjoy it. It's good stuff. Probably going to be better than what we're in for. <laughs> All right, Ring, let's hear that next message. The next comment is about Hal Jordan and comes from Celtic 527. Transmitting in 3, 2, 1. Hey, Myron and Phil. It's Eric or Celtic 527 here, and let me just say I hope you're both doing well, and it's great to finally be able to write to you guys again. I just want to talk a little bit about my concern with the future of Hal Jordan at DC. Like you said in the last few episodes, Myron, Hal is the Green Lantern, and the success of the franchise has been built on his shoulders. But I think we can all agree since the failed 2011 movie the character has taken a step back in all aspects of the DC universe. Sure Hal has still had his own book the last few years, but he's been absent from the larger DC universe other than a little appearance here and there. It's been quite some time since he's been a recurring member of the League and he's either missed out or had small roles in the last few major DC events. To follow that up with Josh Williamson saying there are plans for Hal let me just say I don't buy it because Scott Snyder told me something similar three years ago. After the end of the first Dark Knight Metal event, it seemed like Hal Jordan was finally back as a member of the League until it was revealed Jon Stewart would be the Green Lantern on the team and not Hal. I did a post on Twitter discussing my frustrations over this and Scott Snyder sent me a personal DM to say, big plans for Hal come summer don't worry. Well unless those plans were just the Morrison book being announced, nothing big really happened for Hal. And ever since then it really does seem like Jon Stewart is the Green Lantern DC wants to focus on. After being in the Justice League book for a few years John is now starring in the only GL title. Also, the last few DC collectibles that have been released featuring Green Lantern were the John Stewart McFarlane action figures as well as John Mego and Spin Master figures. If you look at the only two DC animated shows running right now, Young Justice and Harley Quinn, John Stewart is the main Green Lantern they feature. Even the different live action shows of Arrowverse will have John, Stewart, Diggle making multiple appearances and we know he has a ring. And finally, it was recently revealed by Zack Snyder that he was going to use Jon Stewart in the Snyder Cut before getting shut down by Warner Brothers because of future plans they have for the character. It's clear Jon Stewart is getting all the spotlight right now, and my question for you guys is what does all this mean for Hal Jordan? Thanks for your time and keep up the great work. All right, Eric. Yeah, um, you make a lot of valid points. Um, You you bring up the 2011 uh, 2011 movie, and, you know, and... uh, we can't really talk about it too much because it's like it's been over talked about and over talked about it. And my only opinion about that particular movie was the, the timing of the character being put in a movie on a big screen to which I felt like a, not a lot of the, the public knew who, who the hell Green Lantern was uh, other than Jon Stewart in, in the animated series, if you want to go that far. Uh, plus the marketing, it, to me, it, it felt kind of off. It felt like they just threw a lot at it, and it didn't yield as good of results as they did, so they felt like they were burned. Now, whether they go to touch that character again or not, I don't know. But, I mean, we're, we're, we're years, years past that happening. And, you know, and the comic book, the comic book fandom, you know, they don't tend to let go of things very well, and neither, the, neither do certain actors that play roles, <laughs> like Ryan Reynolds. But um, um, I'm, I know I, I know you talked about Josh Williamson. You and I went back and forth about Josh Williamson before, and I, I don't I don't particularly know what plans he would have for Hal Jordan. I don't. I would like to see him write a book with a minute. I, I, I like I like him as a writer. I, he did great on the Flash, so um, it would be cool if he were to show up on something that he's doing. So, um, and then you talk about the John Stewart stuff. I mean. That's just it, right? And and I've and I've mentioned this to Myron, and I've mentioned this many times on the podcast. I mean, diversity is is, is where your focus point is at for for everything now. Um, you know, you have you have to show that in your in your medium. And I think one thing that that WB and and DC does very well is um, they show a diverse nature of their characterizations. And I don't think Marvel does very well. And I think Marvel fails in that aspect because they don't they know they have a problem with it and they try to force it 
on doing different things. And um, WB's been strong in that category. And there was a really, really good article written for um, um, a Vanity Fair um, uh, article written from Chris Terrario. He wrote the screenplay uh, for the original Justice League, the Snyder Cut. And uh, he had a long conversation with, with um, Ray Fisher, the guy who played Cyborg. And uh, they had this really, really good sit down and did long walks about about what it felt for him to play Cyborg, the character. And, and the thing that, that touched me the most was the fact that uh, Ray Fisher, you know, agreed, mentioned Cyborg. Um, he, 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 don't, he, he can't hide his identity. Uh, he has to wear it out there for people to see and, and for, for criticisms. And uh, if you couple that in for the, the fact that he's a black man, you know, and but Ray Fisher explained it in a way that, you know, uh, the African-American community is, is much in the same way as Cyborg is. You know, we have to wear our skin every day and deal with the criticisms. And so I think when you connect those two like that, I think John Stewart falls into that same kind of category because he, he, he he's the guy that you can build something around, uh, uh, you know, and I, I'll say this, sadly, I feel that way because I'd, I'd rather see Hal Jordan do it. But I understand the point of using a character like Jon Stewart um, and building your franchise around him. Um, you know, if, if if he would have showed up, he would if he would have had his own own gig a while back. I mean, this could have came out before Bla- uh, Black Panther was released, and you know, he could have could have been the first African American superhero on screen. Um, but they dropped the ball, and unfortunately, that's where we are. But Ghost Snyder cut had a good time with it, and you know, and. All valid points, Eric, and, and I agree with you 100% on a lot of the stuff. Yeah, you know, in your comment about DC and, and Marvel and how they do diversity, I think the problem that Warner Brothers has is they've gone overkill. Yeah, they, they do it a lot. They, they, they push a lot of... I mean, it, it almost seems like they're doing it in different in, in different spots just because they want to they want to check all the boxes off, you know? And it's Well, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I get it. I mean, everybody wants representation. I, I know how important that is. Well, I think the problem is, is we've made identity politics more important than the product. Yeah, and 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 that's a fair point. I mean, there was a there was a thing that were they were talking about on that uh, that thing on DC that they put out that round robin thing that's going on, and they had this, and it, you know, I I have my I have my my thoughts on it that. I feel like that's just a, a a poor way to market writing books because you're 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 displaying character. Well, I mean, I'll just I'll just say it. They came out with the JLQ, and I even had to ask somebody. I'm like, I don't understand what that is. And the assumption was it was it was a queer Justice League, and I said, you know, I'm not even queer, but JLQ. They couldn't think of a better title than that. I mean, I don't know. I don't speak for that community, so I can't say if that's right or wrong, but. If you're going to do a round robin and that's where your representation lies for people to vote on whether they think they want to have those type of characters or not, I just think that's kind of shameless. I thought the whole concept was bad because if anything, yeah. it's pitting fans against each other. Oh, and yeah. if you're saying there's only going to be one that's going to get printed, that's an awful, awful thing because at some point you've alienated a bunch of fans who's looking at these projects and saying, oh, I would love this. Oh, I would love that. And they're not going to get to see it because they didn't want a popularity contest. Um, <laughs> yeah. to, to talk about JLQ, it was interesting when you looked at the votes, there were more people voting on that book than were voting on the other books. Is that because there's a large force of uh, people who read comics that wanted that book? And they voted for that book and didn't bother voting in the other contest? Or did people just show up to vote for it because they want to see the queer characters in a book? And they, I mean, they, have, they have no intent to buy it, but, you know. I mean, that's just it. I, I just, I don't know, I don't know what their per, their point was doing that, but um, whatever, man. I just, I, I say that time and time and time again, and some of the decision making that go on, that just, it befuddles me. Well, yeah, it's, it's the same thing, you know, the, the, the John Stewart Diggle thing. I think that is such a poor decision. I like John Diggle. To me, John Diggle was a very important is a very important character on Arrow, and he's a character in his own right. And turning him into John Stewart, he was good enough already as John Diggle. Yeah, right. I you mean, know? that's what I felt too. I thought it was kind of weird. I mean, don't get me wrong; he would make a great John Stewart, but I don't think 
I mean, like you said, I mean, John Diggle was a good character in, in his own right. Right. I don't need to see him with a power ring just for some, yeah. just, just to, to make some fanboy casting thing come to fruition. I, I don't think we need it. I don't think we needed that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, you could build a universe around any of these characters. Uh, you know, I, I think more important than some other kinds of diversity, diversity of thought is the most important thing. And I, would never choose to promote a character based you know if you're choosing a character or choosing something or choosing someone because of their identity choices or how they look or how they pray or how you know any of those things that's that's not that you're doing the, you're doing the wrong thing thinking you're doing the right thing i mean to me it's about the quality of the person underneath all of those labels that matters. Well, and, then, and, then, and then think about it like this. And then you got fans like you and I, right? And, and I'll go on in the lame and say, when I, when I saw the bracket, I was confused. I didn't know what the hell was going, going on at first. But then I started looking at it, and I was like, okay, I get it. Now it makes sense. Now, I'm a firm believer in, in, in equality, and, and, and I'll stand for anybody's rights because, because that, that's how I'm made and how I stand for it. I see a book like JLQ, okay, so it's going to be all queer superheroes. I'm cool with that. I want you to do it. Now, I'll vote for it because I think it needs to be done. However, that doesn't mean I'm going to read it. Well, okay, but then all of a sudden it's going to lose. And it's like, okay, well, now now you're in a lose-lose situation because you just now you just lost the book because, you know, obviously nobody wanted it or whatever the case may be. And then you just alienated that particular community. You know, yeah. and with no promises that that book's going to come out. Right. I think I think you alienate people more than you you make people get excited right. for it. True. Uh, but anyway, all yeah. right. Power ring. We've got one more message left. Fire away. The last message comes from Mark, and he's commenting on Zack Snyder's Justice League review from our last episode. Transmitting in three, two, one. Thanks for the review of Zack Snyder's Justice League. If this was Marvel Studios. They would have selected their Jon Stewart for HBO Max and introduced him on a huge stage in the Martian Manhunter scene in Justice League. I didn't like Martian Manhunter's makeup. Where's the trademark pronounced forehead? All right, Mark, thank you so much for your comments. I I wasn't sure, you know, when Phil and I talked about reviewing Zack Snyder's Justice League, we were like, well, will people want to listen to us talk about something that's not Green Lantern? But hopefully people did. Uh, I I don't know. I I think, you know, reading some of the articles that have come out, I don't think that Warner Brothers learned their lesson with the failure of Green Lantern. Uh, in reading how the studio meddled and, and how they continued to try to force their will on the project rather than, you know, what I think Marvel gets right is that Marvel Studios takes the money and does their own thing and Disney trusts them to make the product because nobody knows the product better than Marvel. And so mm-hmm. they don't tell Marvel, well, this movie's got to be two hours long, and oh, you've got to have this character say this, or you've got to do that. And and I think Warner Brothers doesn't get that. They're still in that old school studio mentality, and that happened on Green Lantern, and it happened on these other movies. And I think you know, there's a lot of things being cast on uh, Jeff Johns and and other people who were people of authority with Warner Brothers, and I don't, I think they were just the guys stuck in the middle. Uh, you know, Joss Whedon, you know, he's got a history of other things. But think about the situation that he was put in, too, is the studio wanted change. They didn't like the tone. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. So you bring on somebody in the last minute to rewrite things, yet you still got to meet this original deadline. That's an awful, terrible amount of pressure to put anybody under. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think you get what we got because the studio didn't distrust DC Entertainment to make the movies they want to make. If you just let them do it, if, if Warner Brothers gave them a chunk of change and said, okay, we're going to give you some seed money, you go and make your first movie, and we'll see how it goes. And if you turn a profit, we'll make more. And, and let DC Entertainment do DC Entertainment rather than Warner Brothers sticking their noses in where they don't need to be, we'd get better product. 
And I think that's one of the huge differences between Marvel and DC when it comes to films these days. You know, one of the things in that article, Phil, that you talked about was that Terrio talked about how there was no forethought as to what movie was going to go first and what movie was going to go second. It was kind of a, you know, throw the title at the dartboard and see what dates you get kind of thing. (laughs) You know, there was no, no organic planning for how you develop the universe. And I think... I think if they had had someone like a Kevin Feige in DC Entertainment who was being allowed to steer that ship and just let Warner Brothers write the checks. Jim Lee comes to mind. Sure, Jim Lee or or Johns could have done it as the chief chief creative officer. That would have been a perfect role for him. I mean, that's where a lot of his stuff comes from, you know, is is his ability to do things with these characters. I mean, you wouldn't have had Cyborg in the Justice League if it wasn't for Jeff Johns. Right, and, and that's a valid point. I mean, I mean, that's, and he mentioned that in that that article that we talk about. I mean, he mentions a lot of that about how Cyborg was one of the, was supposed to be the main character of this movie. Right. I, I think that this this movie was troubled to begin with because you had somebody who had a creative vision that was obviously very very grandiose, and you had a studio system that didn't believe necessarily in the product and still wanted it to be like, oh, we're just going to pump this product out and people are going to love it regardless. And rather than letting people who know the customers, who know the audience, and who know the lore and the mythology and know how to put them to best use, and that's where we're at. And and you know, it's, it, Green Lantern was the same way. You know, you had situations there where you know, the studio wanted certain things. And so that's what they got. And they got an inferior product as a result of it. And in the end, the fans won. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And and I got to agree with you about Martian Manhunter's makeup. You know, the, the forehead to me wasn't pronounced enough. It was a different interpretation, but I do know that that whole sequence was shot as an afterthought. So maybe they didn't put as much into that. I don't know. Um, it's an artistic choice. You know, as we, we talked about, <laughs> there, there are different artistic choices that we make and not all of them resonate with everybody. I will, I will say this, and, and, I, and I will say this as a matter of fact. Had that end sequence included Jon Stewart as a Green Lantern, there would be more fans out there right now advocating to get this stuff, this, to, to finish this out. I would go so far as to say it wouldn't matter whether it was Jon Stewart, Hal Jordan, or Kyle Rayner. Okay, well, that's fair, too. You're right. I mean, I don't know. I'm still trying to understand why. I, I'm still trying to hear the when, when I'm going to hear the news that HBO Max is going gonna, is gonna to sign Snyder to finish this out. I just don't know if that would ever happen because I, I think that would come in conflict with what WB is trying to do. Yeah, I, I think that they want to distance themselves from it. You know, in some ways, that's not a, a bad thing because... <sighs> There, there's so much baggage attached to all of that stuff now. If we're trying to start fresh, then, there really is some kind of baggage. Yeah, then then you have to start fresh. Uh, you know, we have to look at that as a, a vision that's not going to go any further. And, and I'll be honest, I read the the plot points for two and three, and as much as I like Zack Snyder's Justice League, I'm not sure I would have liked where he was going with it. I don't know. I would I would have it would have been cool, but well, something we'll never know. And it's going to be one of life's mysteries. For the, you know what we're going to be doing our podcast when we're what we're eighty. We're going to be talking about how, man, I wish we could have seen the end of Zack Snyder's Justice League. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have Alzheimer's and I won't remember anything else but, just, you know, who knows. Uh, but anyway, so Power Ring, why don't you tell our listeners how they too can be a part of the show? You can become a part of the show by leaving a message up to one minute long on our voicemail line. Call us at 406 pod of oa That's 406-763-6362. You can also email us at podcast at block of oa.com. We'd love to hear from you. Prepare for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Monster Kid Kid Radio. Hear your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Monster Kid Kid Radio. Radio! 
go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters. Modern Talk. And the head of Rondo Hatton. Only on Monster Monster Kid Radio. Radio. All right, Myron. Episode 191 in the bag. And it was uh, John Stewart heavy, I'd have to say. Yeah, I would say that. I would say that. A lot of stuff. Even a lot of listener feedback was a lot of John Stewart stuff. Yep. I mean, maybe, maybe that's a sign. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Just, I hate to say it, man. I, I'm just. I I had to, I had to bite it when when I knew this issue was coming out because I was like, man, I'm not looking forward to reading about John Stewart all the time. However, that said, after reading the first issue, um. I I I'm going to read it and I'm going to see if I can develop a different type of relationship with John Stewart, uh, mainly because of different writers uh, doing them. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go into it thinking like that and and see if there's something doesn't come out of it. I want to know whether that road sign you see is danger ahead or yield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be one of those ones. Where, it's gonna be one of those things that says a uh, low ceiling. <laughs> my head off. Uh, all right uh, but that's how i'm gonna do it uh we'll see we'll see yeah and, and you know and like i said I, I, it's it's not that john stewart's the, the lead character in the book that really isn't it i just have a problem with a writer saying they hate something and then they're writing it and, you yeah. know whether 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 you treat the character badly on page or you could treat them badly by omission because you have it a personal agenda it's still bad it's still wrong it is anyway it is. Anyway. So good sportsmanship when writing. Anyway, I'm, I got I got to stop. <laughs> All right, man. Let's let's put a pin in that. All right, let's do that. So next time, I'm not sure what we're going to talk about yet. We'll have to figure out uh, what we want to do as a retro review, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll see what happens. But we should be back in a couple of weeks, my friends. Uh, till then, treat each other well, keep your power ring charged, and make every day your brightest day. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogavoa.com. You can also find the Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties.